So Alan, I'll let you start. Okay. Beloved civil rights leader, theologian, mystic, and educator Howard Thurman wrote, community cannot feed for long on itself. It can only flourish where always the boundaries are giving way to the coming of others from beyond them, those unknown and undiscovered brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Thurman Conversations. The Reverend Dr. Howard Thurman believed it was possible to humanize the other for black and brown and white people to find each other, to heal our divisions and to be humans together in ways that make us all come alive. Today, our guest is Nina Ikawa. Nini is the executive, Nina, excuse me, is the executive director for the Berkeley Food Institute. She joined the Institute in 2015 as its inaugural policy director, creating a policy education and engagement program for UC Berkeley students, staff, faculty, and the general public. She previously served in the office of U.S. Senator Daniel K. Inouye and with the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food initiative. In 2011, she was named a Food and Community Fellow by the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. She was the founding food and agriculture editor for Hyphen Magazine, and her writings on our changing food system have been published widely. She received a BA in Interdisciplinary Studies Food Policy from UC Berkeley and an, and an MA in International Relations and Food Policy from Meiji Gakuen University in Tokyo. She volunteers for the California Farmer Justice Collaborative, the Center for Urban Education on Sustainable Agriculture, and Japanese American Women Alumnae of UC Berkeley. Our conversation tonight will no doubt bring up questions for us. So you folks who are joining us, please feel free to type questions in the chat. Our producer will gather them and share them with us at the end so we can answer as many as we can. This is a chance to ask an expert everything you are wondering about what goes on in food, race and history, reparations, anything else that comes up in our talks. A special thank you to our mission partners, the Race Task Force for the Episcopal Church in Colorado and St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Lakewood, and to our producer, Michelle Auerbach. My name is Alan Cole, and I will be host this evening. Before we begin, we need to acknowledge that the Thurman Conversations come to you from the unceded territories of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples. We acknowledge those communities, their elders, their stories, past and present, and the emerging future that dismantles the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Welcome, Nina. Thank you, Reverend. I'm very honored to be invited and really grateful to be here. Great, thank you for taking the time. We, it's a little earlier for us, so we, we're gonna have folks sort of joining probably uh, here, here and there. Um, well, thank you for accommodating me before my children start screaming. That I think that does account for, we'll make for a better discussion. <laughs> yeah, ch children get what, children are who they are at whatever time that is. So thanks yeah. for being <laughs> so Tell us about your food journey and how you got interested in food systems work. Great, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, you know, I guess I was always interested in food systems. Um, I was always interested in food. I grew up in a family that did care a lot about food, like so many other families. And then I became involved in political activism as a high school student and college student. And I guess it took me a while to understand they could go together, <laughs> uh, that they didn't have to be separate. And it, it really, I, I studied this stuff as sort of a fantastical journey as an undergrad, but it wasn't until I got to graduate school and my graduate school advisor said, you know, this could actually be something. Climate change is happening. Food and agriculture are part of it. This can actually be a career. I said, you must be kidding me. Like, this is not a serious stuff. Um, but I'm really grateful to my teachers who, um, you know, endorsed me to go further to really study and understand um, how, you know, how issues of, of food justice, food access that I saw concerned me, you know, I grew up in a very mixed income public school and, you know, I saw kids who had plenty of money and very fancy school lunches and other kids who were hiding the fact that they couldn't afford any school lunch. And, you know, I just saw what a crazy situation that is. And I originally did become interested in, um, you know, food for young children and started studying school lunch programs 
um, inequities and how those programs are delivered. And I just went down the rabbit hole from there. So what feels most, what feels most relevant to you about doing this kind of change work right now in the middle of COVID and with this new administration? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, COVID has been, you know, has been an interesting uh, tragedy. I mean, it's it's been an absolute tragedy, but it's also ripped a Band-Aid off so many problems that we knew were in the United States and around the world, right? In terms of access to healthcare, um, how we as a community see ourselves as connected. You know, we may have had a self-delusion in the past that I can be fine and who cares about my neighbor, but, you know, facing a respiratory disease and you're all in an indoor situation, I guess, you and your neighbor being separate are no longer, is no longer an illusion that can hold. And I think in the same way, in terms of food systems, so many people became aware of food systems because of COVID, right? And in the very beginning, you know, there was a lot of worry of shortages and in a first world country like our own, many people have not been used to having shortages and there was panic buying and gou price gouging. Some of our worst impulses came out. Um, but as the economic impacts deepened, of course, so many of us saw hunger on an unprecedented level. And again, that's been around for a long time, but it, it shoved it on the front pages. And I, I do think that's a blessing because hopefully it's made more people aware of, of the inequities um, and problems in our food system that we've had. So that was the beginning of the pandemic, the middle of the pandemic. And hopefully now that we're coming to the end of the pandemic and we do have a new administration, um, you know, we can try to, uh, you know, President Biden says build back better, and I'm not usually a fan of politician slogans, but I do think that that one has made me think a lot about how we should rebuild post pandemic. And, um, you know, that includes really food workers, which is a big focus of our work at uh, the Berkeley Food Institute. Uh, you know, some of the, um, some of the really most shocking uh, breakdowns in our society, I think, happened around food workers during this pandemic. Um, you know, all this rhetoric around essential workers um, really uh, served to help customers feel good about themselves for buying food that might have put disproportionately black and brown workers at life-threatening risk, that put undocumented workers um, you know, disabled workers, workers with pre-existing conditions, single parents, and as I mentioned, at black and brown immigrant refugee um, workers at disproportionate risk. So that's something that we have to fix because we're not going to have another pandemic. You know, that's it happens that way. So um, you know, coming out of it, I'm I'm heartened by efforts around the country to vaccinate food workers, to give food workers hazard pay. Um, but, but I think that we are going to see a reshifting around of our priorities um, to make our society more just, I really hope so. And, you know, some news reports coming out, for instance, that some food work, you know, restaurant workers don't want to go back to the, the old bad jobs. And that's not just because they've received unemployment assistance. It's because some of those jobs are not fit for anyone. <laughs> so I think, um, we're gonna to have to, you know, see, see a realignment. I hope I answered your question. You did. I, I want to. If I make a quick comment, um, please. The the state of Colorado has a Senate bill that's up for debate right now, I believe, um, that our producer has been working on. It's um, it's for agricultural rights. Mm -hmm. It's in the the, the death of um, food workers. We we had one of those here. Um, not that long ago, which uh, unfortunately um, brought a lot of attention to the issue here in the state of Colorado. So I, 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 we hear what you're saying. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about, um, you, you were, continue, I'm sorry, I, <laughs> I interrupted you. No, no, you didn't, you didn't. I'm, I'm, I'm eager to hear about that. I mean, um, you know, his, historically, if folks are interested in getting more interest, you know, going down the research path, um, what's amazing is how agriculture and food workers have been cut out of um, 
so many other discussions in our democratic society. So that's the thing that also kind of shocked me when I started researching and being more involved in this is that, um, and I think that this descends, this comes from slavery in our, our country's beginnings and, you know, um, beginnings in enslavement of African peoples was the sense that in certain fields, there's no rules. <laughs> in certain fields, there are rules. If you're going to be a lawyer or a car salesperson or, you know, other kind of um, positions, you have very strict rules governing. But if you're going to be working in a field or waiting tables or um, maybe deliver today delivering food for DoorDash, um, these are um, areas that our society has decided only here in the United States should be free from regulation and trust the employer to figure it out best. And um, I think that, you know, wise people <laughs> everywhere are starting to question that agreement, you know, um, that's just been part of the American agreement for so long. And um, it just, it doesn't make sense. For instance, on the tipping issue, which we worked on a lot at Berkeley, you know, I've been to no tipping restaurants and they're great. Mm -hmm. The service is great. The people have a professional job. They show up on Monday and they leave on Friday or they show up on Wednesday and they leave on Sunday and they get the same amount of work, money that the, anybody else who works in a job does. So what's the panic, you know? Um, <laughs> you know, if people perform poorly, they're let go of just like in any other position. So this, this, we don't have to cling to some of these old ways of, you know, sort of um, patron servant relationship um, that um, for some reason we've allowed to endure in food systems and, and not in, in other parts of our society. So, you know, that's one of the things we're really working on at, at Berkeley Food Institute. And we're trying to also capture people's excitement about food that has been growing in recent years and turn that for good because we do think that that's an exciting thing that more people are watching food TV shows or buying cookbooks or in the pandemic cooking more at home. All of this is great. Um, and, you know, we, we, we see a lot of new, you know, joiners to this movement. So we're excited by that. So there is, um, I'm sure you're more aware than most, there's a lot of disinformation Yes. Um, about food, food systems, and the whole landscape of what we hear and and don't hear. Um, mm -hmm. Can you can you weave that together with some of the science and some of the realities of workers and tell us about that? Great question. Well, I have a slightly different view than some of my colleagues, maybe at the university. Is that I have a lot of sympathy for folks who have joined on to disinformation. Um, partially because I think that our institutions have failed a lot of people. For example, our healthcare system is non-functional in this country. And as a result, you know, in past decades, a lot of people have turned to the internet to self-diagnose and self-treat. And the United States, I think, leads the world in quackeries, snake oil doctors, all kinds of people selling something they cooked up in their closet, got a book published in, on Amazon, and all of a sudden they're leading an army. Um, and, um, I think that's a direct result of, you know, people's lack, people's being rejected from actual healthcare and nutrition information. And if we had say universal single payer healthcare, as every other developed country does, then people could have a sense that their doctor is someone to trust or the nutritionist or dietitian is someone to trust, and they could have a, a better relationship with facts and research. But when our system has instead, um, you know, left people completely on their own, then they're completely on their own. And, you know, I know a lot of people who've um, had not had health insurance for many years. And so, yes, they were self-treating with Dr. Google. And so, you know, um, I think that we, we need to do both at the same time. You know, we need to uh, call attention to quackery. We need to make, make, make ways for science to be front and center, but we also need to um, rebuild systems to be more responsive to people and to be accessible to people um, because otherwise people are going to survive however they can. And I think, you know, current, you know, current responses to the vaccine are very uh, disturbing, but not unexpected because people 
who, I mean, I have gone vaccinated, but I've had health care for now a number of years in my full-time university job. So I'm very privileged. And if I need to reach a doctor, if I were to have some unexpected reaction, I know I can get that health care. Now, for many people who, who have been completely on their own, they don't feel that, oh, so now I'm supposed to trust the healthcare system? You know, I mean, this is a, it's an, it's, it's a, it's an about face that many people don't understand. And um, so, you know, I think uh, how we use these social media platforms to dispel rumors or sometimes reject the social media platforms if their fundamental architecture is designed around misinformation <laughs> Um, I think that's really key to how we fix our food system and, and fix our health problems. Is there, um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but there, is there um, some false narrative or a main false narrative for you that's floating around that you would love to dispel? <laughs> that's a great question. Um, sure. False narrative that's floating around to dispel. Um, that there's a, sure, no, this is a great question. And there's a lot of great writers on this um, who I love. I mean, Marian Nessel um, from New York University, who is a proud UC Berkeley graduate. I really love her books because she helps navigate that she has many books describing the food system. And, you know, she takes aim at so-called superfoods and over a course of books. So I, I think that's one myth I would choose to dispel that she always talks about that this one food thing is going to be your, you know, physical, at least physical salvation. I'm not sure about anything else they promise, but you know, um, whether it be blueberries or pineapple or, you know, there's always a thing of the moment. And, and her research has really looked at how um, different food companies have funded some of this single ingredient miracle cure research. And that actually over the course of almost the last hundred years, nutrition advice has barely changed, which is don't eat too much, eat fruits and vegetables, eat whole grains, don't eat too much meat. And, um, you know, she also talks about how industry influence has attempted to obscure some of that really common sense advice. Because for instance, that last one, which is not about being vegetarian, but about not eating too much meat has been, you know, it's a scientific consensus, but it does threaten profits of some companies. So, um, you know, there's been a lot of confusion for everyday citizens about that guidance, which is unnecessary. So, um, you know, I think knowing that there's all different kinds of eating patterns according to one's culture and preferences that fit with, you know, nutrition advice, I would just reassure folks that that's, it, it's, it's not too, you know, it shouldn't be too stressful. You know, we as Americans, I do think stress out a lot about food and, um, mm -hmm. We have a lot of anxieties, but you know those people who are much smarter than me on this and have been writing and researching for a long time, they're always like, just eat a piece of cake here and there, not a big deal, you know, and eat more fruits and vegetables, eat frozen food, whatever. Like they, they, they are sort of like anti freak out, you know, the actual experts. If, if I was to, if we were to turn our producer, Michelle Auerbach, loose on this comment, she would go off on the diet culture. Okay. All the stuff you're, you're, you're mentioning. Um, so, so I, there's a, there's a false narrative that I hear. Mm -hmm. And I think all of us probably do. And that is that we, um, that we don't, I think it's false. You can tell me it, that we don't produce enough food either nationally or, or globally. What, what, what is, can you add some truth to that for us? Yeah, thanks. That is, I agree with you. That is a false narrative. Um, uh, some statistics show that in the United States, up to 40% of food is wasted. And that includes everything from the farm to production to our, to the grocery stores, to our own refrigerators. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that is a crisis right there that we really need to fix. And right there, you know, under, uh, undermines any claims that I think we aren't producing enough. Actually, in many parts of the world, and definitely in the United States, we're overproducing, and that's creating uh, a lot of problems for our economy, for people's health, uh, for farmers. So, you know, when the United States was begun, we were just starting out as a country, and there was a lot of emphasis on building up production, and every country that begins 
you know, wants to um, stockpile reserves and make sure that their people are okay. And that's completely understandable. But something about the United States, we sort of got on automatic pilot and we've just been focused on, on stockpiling and, and producing. And when it, when it became too much, of course, for our own people to consume, we uh, became bent on um, getting everyone around the world to consume our products. And that is part of, you know, our, our drive as a country to be the number one business leader. And we've all, you know, or some people have reaped the benefits of those profits, but um, there are, um, especially when you get into foreign countries, it gets much more complicated to say, I need you to eat this, or I need you to buy this. Or if actually, if you trace it historic, more historically, United States relationships to other countries has often been, here's this food for free first, and then starting next year, you can start to buy it. You know, mm -hmm. not too different from, you know, a drug dealer. Uh, so, um, you know, so that's, that's how we've acted as a country with other countries. And so the narrative of feed the world, I think, falls into that. Um, a lot of assumptions about those people that need feeding and it can serve to undermine the many, many diverse cultures around the world. And they're also their diverse uh, local growing conditions. Of course, in the time of a natural disaster, like a flood or something, some people need emergency food, but um, uh, we've, I think we've found through history that U.S. imposing its um, ideas for what the locals should eat has led, you know, led more to private profits and less to actually the reduction in hunger. So when I work with students um, at, at UC Berkeley, you know, um, and if they do want to work overseas, which I think is a great idea, I always say that, you know, it has to be based in a principle called food sovereignty, which is about how, um, but you can also call it food self-reliance, is, is how those local people want to eat or, you know, how they want to control their own food system. And if there's a way we can contribute to that, great, but there may not be, imagine this, there may not be a role for an American. <laughs> so, um, you know, to have that humility, I think is really important because the other thing is, you know, food, as we all know, is a very intimate and personal part of someone's life, you know, not even too different from religion or sex or something else that you might not want to talk about with a neighbor. So, um, you know, how someone eats is, is very personal to their own, to their own preferences and um, getting involved in someone else's preferences is something I try to stay away from. And it's, that's also why I prefer to stick to um, policies, which mm -hmm. we, we do have responsibility for. Yeah. I was you know, going back to something you said a minute ago about um, an excess of food, produ food production, food um, production. Our church, St. Paul's in Lakewood, along with other churches in the Denver metro area and several really productive outreach agencies like the Action Center in Jefferson County or Food Bank of the Rockies or Benefits in Action and God knows how many other, they get a lot of their food mm -hmm. from, from the, the, the back um, decks of mm -hmm. grocery stores, mm -hmm. uh, pallets and pallets of, of I mean, sometimes it's dry goods, more often than not, it's fruits, um, especially in the summertime, starting about, about now. Mm -hmm. uh, so we see, I mean, not only, I mean, with all that excess, and even when, though it's all being used or a, a greater portion of it's being used now, we mm -hmm. have seen in our own food distributions from the church an incredible rise in food insecurity since COVID. It's, it, we, we had to go from twice a month to four times a month with, with four, five, six, seven, eight times as many, as many people. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just nuts around, around nuts. here, I guess, as, as everywhere. Um, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. No, go ahead. What were you going to say? Yeah, I mean, down the street, we have a recycling center down the street from my house, and some, it used to always be just a few people lining up with shopping carts, and then recently I drove by there, and it's a line around the street, around the corner of cars. So that means people in both shopping carts and cars are lining up for hours to deposit their recyclables. So I think that, you know, and same at the food banks, you know, the Trump administration, when the pandemic hit, the Trump administration made a few decisions, one of which was to, was to, um, answer the calls of, 
um, the meat industry, which said we shall not um, slow down production. That was one of the things they did and, and keep the slaughterhouses open, keep the production lines open, no matter how much it put people in danger. Another decision they made, which killed people really, was to say that we will shut down parts of the economy that we're being forced to and give people no type of support. Um, you know, so people had to choose between death or death and what a crazy, you know, um, calculation. And so, you know, every other country that had the resources to ask people to stay home, then they paid them a stipend so that they could survive. And this is the only country where, you know, we've finally got a few stipends a little bit at the end, but um, people who couldn't work, I mean, it was, it was just crazy how much people were left alone. I'm sure many folks, you know, many people also had that same feeling. I had a feeling of terror at the beginning of the pandemic, like, wow, they're not going to do anything for us. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's, uh, my heart just goes out to those families. And I really, I, my heart goes out to those families who have not gotten, you know, pandemic relief, even through all this, you know, financial relief. Um, it was, you know, the height of irresponsibility. I know now here in California, we're trying to do some fixes to send uh, relief to undocumented families, because let's also remember that many undocumented folks were the, were the only ones working. I think in New York City, they said food delivery workers are over half or something of are undocumented. So these are the people putting themselves at most risk to help all of us get food. Someone who's homebound or immunocompromised has to have a delivery. So there, it's a very important service. And then when the pandemic starts to ease or we finally get it together to send checks, they don't even get that. So um, yeah, it's, um, it's, a, it's a lot we have to fix and I hope that we can fix it from the root, you know, and not just from the symptom. Well, yeah, um, I mean, you're with the, the sermon conversations is, you know, starts with the Episcopal church in, in Colorado. So it's kind of a faith-based initiative, I, I, I guess. Uh, it, you could, I mean, at least that's where it spawns and it's just societal. So, um, but even though we've seen and faith-based communities of, of all traditions have tried to respond to this emergency food, um, need. It, it seems as though more and more, at least as I see the political work, sure. that ending hunger is a political decision. That's right. Um, I mean, it, it, it can work in, in, you know, in our local communities, but without, you know, talk to us about anti-policy, anti mm -hmm. anti-poverty policy. Mm -hmm. oh, just tell us yeah. what you're thinking about all that. Well, yeah, it's both. And, you know, I mean, the faith community has done such a wonderful job of emergency food relief and we we can never get you know we can never abandon that work right that's still so important to do um and we can also look at the structural conditions that have created that poverty for example you know static wages in the united states over the last what three or four decades you know um there's a i think a joint senate committee on the minimum wage that is, you know, bipartisan group in our U.S. Senate has concluded that our minimum wage has fallen over the years, right? And that if our minimum wage had kept up with, with the cost of living, it would be something like twenty-five dollars now. And people are fighting over is fifteen dollars too much. So, you know, at the Berkeley Food Institute, over and over, we have come back to the issue of wages, which can be the most controversial, but yet it is so so important to think about because. Otherwise, it's it's a it's a useless um, uh, you know a useless treadmill um, to ask someone to work full time in a job that does not allow them to feed themselves and their families. You know, I, there's a few slogans that have come out recently. I know that there was one slogan. Uh, there was a Marriott strike, and their slogan was "One job should be enough." You know, very simple. Yeah. Um, you know, another slogan that I've heard recently. Um, in an anti-hunger campaign, they were going to borrow from, you know, John and Yoko in the 70s, which was to say, hunger is over if you want it. You know, they had that big billboard that says war is over if you want it. And the thing with hunger is that nobody wants to be hungry and people want, you know, dignity of a job, people getting out of incarceration or people that have disabilities or, you know, mental health challenges or any other people still deserve to have gainful employment and it shouldn't make them poorer 
if you work, you know? And so I think, I think that we can all work towards that. And um, yeah, it just, it, it, you know, it gets sticky if a company is used to paying people $8 an hour, you know, I can understand why they're going to have to adjust the balance book <laughs> sheet a little bit um, to pay people a living wage. But otherwise, what are we doing running around um, um, plugging the holes in that system? And, and as we know, it's cre it creates a lot of anxiety for families. And there's a lot of research on long-term impacts for children of growing up that way and, and having to um, not know where the next meal is coming from. I mean, it's just barbaric. It, it's not anything that anyone should have to deal with. So I think, you know, we can all be involved in current um, discussions around, you know, minimum wage, um, tipped minimum wage, which uh, many states are discussing whether to bring all their wages on the same level. You know, there's a special carve out for jobs that include tips. And uh, people that do those jobs are not mostly teenagers just starting out at the burger stand. They're mostly women of color raising families as the statistics bear out. So, um, you know, how do we, uh, how do we, um, you know, have everyone be able to eat after working a hard day's work? You know, that's, that seems to me just, just the bare minimum. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and I think faith faith community has a really strong, has a really, you know, important role to play in that. If anything else, then, you know, if we can achieve that, then you all can get out of the food pantry business and do other stuff. I mean, wouldn't that be a dream? Because there's so many other things um, we can do with each other. You know, we can start growing food and giving it away for free just for fun as a, as a, you know, as an extra benefit, not something that's for survival, you know? Yeah, I love the, the notion of, of working with some joy behind it instead of yeah. being, you know, we're always responding to some crisis. It yeah. seems, you know, that's, I mean, I guess that, that is our job, you know, responding mm -hmm. to people who are in the crisis. Um, I, I know that here in Colorado, not, not unlike many areas in the country, we've seen a huge influx of, of people coming into the state and it's, mm -hmm. it's increased our prices. Mm. I mean, Rent is out of control. Homelessness has increased, mm -hmm. um, especially since 2008, um, 9, 10. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it really, I mean, not, not only do we have, have a, a homeless situation, but that situation leads to more and more hunger and food banks and more kitchen soup kitchens are overrun. Um, mm -hmm. So I, t tell us about, what do, you, what do you think about the notion of gentrification? and people out, what, what does all that mean to you? Well, I'm not an expert in housing policy. I know that it's, there's a lot of overlaps with food policy, but I do try to stay in my lane. There's a lot of people a lot smarter than me looking at um, housing policy. So um, you should ask them, it's particularly, you know, housing pricing and, and who gets to live where, that's a really important issue right now, but I'm not the one to speak on it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, I guess I was more thinking about how it relates to to just the what it what the impact on the food system, which just yeah. seems more, you know, more stress. Well, again, I mean that's why minimum wage debates have come up a lot in places that are increasingly high income or have an increasingly high income disparity, right? Like Seattle or San Francisco. So I think that that's why it, it or even Hawaii, you know, that's why minimum wage and the and bringing up the bottom is a way to start to address those problems because if you used to have a city that was at this income level or maybe let's say this one and all of a sudden it's this one but there are plenty of people who can pay plenty the idea is to make the jobs at the bottom more attractive and more livable um, and to allow people who are working at the bottom so-called bottom or entry level to be able to live in those communities where there are many very wealthy people so it just makes sense you know that um you know, if, if the entire standard of living in an area is lower, then that, you know, that's different. But in an area where there are so many billionaires, say, um, oops, it said just the meeting ended. No, it you're didn't. fine. Okay. You're fine. Maybe there was something else. <laughs> I wonder if there was something else I was like still sign off for. But anyway, um, you know, is that often 
with that gentrification when areas get much more expensive and food jobs absolutely play into this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people cannot afford to live who want to work in that area. I mean, we have that in California in you know, wine country uh, where there's you know, these very exclusive wineries and there has to be someone who works out on those farms, but they don't have any place to live right. based on the wages they're getting. So it's both about building housing, but also, again, something so simple as having someone who works there to be able to afford to live there um, seems pretty basic. There's a, there's a comment that we hear all, all the time, and it might get a rise out of you. And this is where I wanted to go with, with my, my the mentioning homelessness. Mm -hmm. All the time, this phrase, you know, we, we want to um, teach people. Um, we don't want to give people a fish. We want to teach them to fish. Hmm. What, is, what is your response to that? Well, I think self-sufficiency is a wonderful thing, you know, and, and um, that's this idea of self, food sovereignty and how people can do for themselves is a wonderful thing. But in a modern capitalistic society where you need things like a job and a driver's license, I don't quite understand. I'll just say that that metaphor comes to a limit when... Um, <laughs> let's say you need to have a driver's license to vote and um, you need an income and a bank account in order to receive a stimulus payment. Let's just say that as one example for, you know. So how, how can being taught how to fish really get you access to those services? You see what I'm saying? So I, I think, again, it's both and like, you know, I've been, I participated in some urban agriculture training programs that were for like formerly incarcerated people. And, you know, they found that at the end of them, there were pluses and minuses. Some of those programs had big dreams about those folks finding jobs. They didn't find jobs and that is a failure. And how are we gonna get those folks jobs? However, the, the success of it was many, many of them just started farming and gardening in the backyard or a balcony in a pot and did get access to a little more food and also have a sense of empowerment to, to grow their own food. So, so I think that's an example of how um, we shouldn't confuse food sovereignty with like every man is an island. Because, you know, the teach a person to fish almost says like, you have to do it all yourself. And that's, that's a, you know, a misreading of, of how society actually functions in which we're so inter interdependent and some of the people with the most wealth and power in our society have gotten there through huge help um, from either the government or their families. So um, it's, it's, it's unfair to expect others to so-called go it alone. Right, it sounds like to me, it fits right into the American narrative of, you know, everybody should be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. it's not really, not, that's not accessible to everybody. Nor is it factually correct, you know, because yeah. Those, again, those, those celebrated entrepreneurs in American history, like I said, got so many, many of them got so many government subsidies or so many handouts from, you know, their family or, or were the beneficiaries of slavery or something. So, you know, I, I think it's, 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 it's a false narrative of, of go it alone. One book I'd love to recommend that we read a lot at Berkeley is uh, called Lentil Underground, which is also written by a Berkeley grad. And it's an um, explanation of a group of Montana farmers who converted um, to organic lentils, um, both to save their business and to save the soil. And but the book talks in a much deeper way about how they survived due to interdependence. Yeah. And um, and these uh, you know brave Montana cowboys who you know are ex are expected to you know be the epitome of the Marlboro man um, or something like that. They were deeply, deeply dependent on each other, and yeah. um, proudly so. Um, so let's shift gears a little bit and move outside the USA. Tell us about um, your work in other parts of the world and how culture um, works together with food in those places. Oh, thank you. I love to talk about that, and I miss traveling once this pandemic is over. Um, so I'm fourth generation Japanese American. My mom's family came to California in 1895 to start farming as so many immigrants did in that time. And I didn't, you know, I grew up fully as an American. Um, and so in college, I really wanted to go to Japan and find out what's happening over there. And also I wanted to study food systems in a, in a country that was a little older than the United States. You know, we're just a baby country in the greater scheme of things. So um, it was wonderful to go to Asia and 
you know, in, in these discussions of food and health, I also wanted to see how were they living as a country that is a wealthy country that is not dying of diet related diseases. So I wanted to see, you know, how they're navigating these complications of <clears throat> overeating, undereating, how to feed kids, all those kind of questions. So I went there first to study abroad as an undergraduate and then went back to do my graduate degree there. And I worked under a professor who was doing a lot of fair trade from Latin America to Asia. So we also did research in Mexico um, and Me Mexico and Bolivia to look at how farmers were creating more sustainably produced items and selling them to uh, wealthy consumers in Japan and Korea and China. So that was, you know, fascinating. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, other countries have been doing this for a lot longer than we have, you know, and um, some of our debates about whether we should do things the way we did it in the 1990s or the 1950s, you know, are a little bit funny because, you know, say in China, they're talking about, should we grow ri rice the way we did a thousand years ago or 2000 years ago? <laughs> 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 Africa is no different, you know, I mean, there's really thousands of years of history of, of um, how to grow how to eat crops that grow complementarily, you know, how to make food, healthy food, delicious and attractive, how to make kids eat it, you know, all of these everyday challenges we all face. Um, there's a lot of innovation all around the world. So, you know, naively I came back home and I assumed everybody would want to hear about this. Most Americans I found, <laughs> most people I work with, they didn't care at all. Um, but, you know, I'm still holding out hope that we can learn from other countries because, um, you know, that'll be our survival. <laughs> well, it sounds like to me that what you're saying is that in other countries, they, it, the, the food production may be, um, may require a more highly skilled worker and it may be part of their culture and their, you know, and, and, and because of that, it, it's, it's more sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder what's, what's keeping, what's keeping us as Americans from, from moving into that sort of thoughtfulness about our food. Hmm. Well, I think this is where the faith community comes in. And I'm so glad to be in touch with you all because, um, you know, the idea of seeing food as sacred and precious is one that, that connects cultures all around the world. You know, many cultures even have um, a de deity or a patron saint or um, some sort of you know, spiritual connection to the staple food in their area, right? Whether that be a yam or grain of rice or, you know, stalk of rice or stalk of wheat or something, there's a, a deep sense of gratitude. And I think that, that that performs multiple functions. It it lowers food waste for one, um, you know, it, it, it venerates potentially those that produce it. Although of course, exploitation happens all around the world. Um, but also, you know, it, it allows people to feel that they are part of something bigger. And I think we as Americans made a big mistake in the 20th, 20th century of saying that food, like I said, it's just any other product, it's just a widget, you know? Make a car, make a computer chip, make a, make a dinner. It's all the same, you know? And, and um, it's, it's just not true. And our bodies are telling us so, you know? It's, it's, it's just not true. And so, I think you know we we that's why the local food movement is so exciting because it's about people restoring their understanding of the area they live in and celebration of the food ways that come out of there you know so for you all in Colorado or us in California you know what was grown by the native people here how do different waves of immigrants bring their food ways and how do we celebrate you know what's here for instance new mexicans you know they're fanatic about their chiles i think that's great you know that's their local product that they treat us very special. And I think that we should get all, all the states in the United States and all the regions, let's get to that, you know, hyper local food patriotism, you know, um, because I think that can start to um, potentially restore a better relationship with food. I mean, for example, when I lived in Japan, you know, don't mess with their rice, right? And it's created various political problems, but I respect that that's their product. You know, an American, you know, bankers are like, why don't you buy our cheap American rice, you know, and other countries are like, just take our stuff. It's the same thing, you know, leave, leave your antiquated policies. And they're like, no, rice is on our every, on our altars at home. 
rice is in every temple. It's in ceremonies for a newborn baby and ceremonies for when someone leaves this earth. Like we are growing and eating Japanese rice. And I guess that's maybe a type of protectionism, but I also think it's, it's something um, we might consider. Well, so we've got some questions coming in. Well, One of the questions is, first question, beyond voting, writing, our Congress people, um, how do you suggest we help? That's a great question. I think getting involved locally is really important. Um, uh, we hosted a, an, an author from Texas last year named Bettina Elias Siegel, and she's um, done a lot of activism on kids' food in for her Houston Unified School District. And um, we kind of brought her as a parent um, activist example because she's really led the charge in getting you know candy out of soccer practices and um, you know improving school food there you know for, so she even opened my eyes I have just little children I haven't faced that yet but I had no idea that for instance candy and soda companies have so infiltrated every single waking hour of our children's existence and she gives actually her book I think it's called kid food it gives a great step-by-step um, -step tips on how to change that in your own local area oh I see someone's cutting their purple cabbage that's cool um, so <laughs> You know, I think starting locally is great and, and um, then sharing those strategies with others. You know, if you do something, let's say in a school that's local, write to Bettina Siegel while you're doing it and let her know. And then you can join her network of parent activists all around the country. So um, it's, it's hard, but I think it's very rewarding to try to make those changes locally. So for instance, at UC Berkeley, of course, we're working nationally, internationally, but we're always also looking at our own dining services, our off-campus housing, and what's happening locally, because that's always an opportunity for experimentation and improvement. I imagine you have some thoughts on fast food. Um, mm -hmm. is there, do we want to get rid of fast food? Um, what, what do you think? Um, you know, I am not a purist. <laughs> I'm a working mother of two, and I am very aware of the historic legacy of women having to do food provisioning for almost everyone since the beginning of time. <laughs> so I will, as a feminist, I will never be against shortcuts. I think that um, as Americans, we can do better to learn about healthy fast food mm -hmm. um, that actually, again, around the world, they're often better at. Um, for example, you know, things like empanadas or in Jap Japan, they have rice balls or, you know, in Japan, when I used to live there, they would have a vendor that goes by the kids' schools that sells a, a steamed sweet potato wrapped in aluminum foil. And he sings a song and rings a bell. And, you know, especially in winter, it's like a special treat to crack open this very hot, steamy sweet potato and eat the whole thing, you know, skin and all. It's a sort of a country snack. Um, you know, so that's, fa that's fast food too, isn't it? You know, it, you didn't make it and it's fast and it's cheap. So, and, and a lot of cultures have this tradition. So I think, um, I think we can, you know, not throw the baby out with the bathwater and say that, you know, I'm, oh, everyone should make all their food from scratch because I think that collectivizing food production presents a lot of efficiencies. You know, for example, school lunch. Someone reminded me recently that school lunch, part of the reason school lunch was invented was to allow women to get back to the work workplace, you know, in, in World War II. So that's what we lost with all school closures this year is, you know, that convenience of one less meal for mothers, mostly mothers to have to make. So um, I think, you know, fast food chains like McDonald's and Wendy's are responsible for a lot of health problems, but I think we can support tamale vendors, and, um, you know, um, sweet potato steamers and, um, you know, a lot of immigrant run, you know, food carts and uh, food courts are a great way to introduce um, sustainable and healthy fast food. Yeah. But you mentioned tamales. Oh, my gosh. During the tamale season, there are people in every parking lot with a cooler of hot, delicious tamales, which is just phenomenal thing to, to be able to purchase from the folks who made them, you know? Exactly. I heard a joke on the internet, you know, why don't we have, 
the women that make tamales, why didn't they organize vaccine distribution? You know, and I agree. <laughs> it's so precise and it was done for, it's been done for thousands of people at a time, the, the you know, scale of magnitude. So yes, I agree with you. That's a, that's a great um, way to look at fast food. And, you know, again, coming back to policy, some states have really um, loosened the policies on, you know, street vending or food courts or lower the barrier of entry for new people to get into food entrepreneurship. And I think that's a great way to um, give some competition to the big fast food chains. Yeah. Oh, you've mentioned faith in food a couple of times and that food is sacred and you mentioned food sovereignty um, and how it cuts down on waste and increases nutrition. Um, I'd love to hear about your own faith tradition and some of the thoughts and wisdom that come that comes out of that oh gosh um, well i'm a bit of a failure member so i i hope our minister isn't watching because i'm not really like a i don't know not really a champion student but um i was raised in well dual faith my father's family um were jewish refugees from eastern europe and my mother's family were japanese american buddhists and that's ended up sort of making more sense to me. And I've, you know, following in that faith tradition of a sort of a, it's called a um, American, Japanese, it's called Buddhist Churches of America, BCA. So by calling it church already tells you something in that um, we survived, it was started the early part, you know, early part of the 20th century by Japanese immigrants. And it survived through, you know, the incarceration of World War II by a little bit altering uh, the format to be less foreign to Americans. So uh, we meet in a church with pews and there is a minister who reads from a book, um, again, because um, this was determined to be, uh, make Buddhism sort of more palatable. It was, you know, banned in many of the camps or seen as a, you know, another point of threatening, not unlike, you know, Muslims were treated, you know, after 9-11. So we, we're a hybrid, <laughs> hybrid faith. Um, uh, and a very forgiving and welcoming faith, which I'm grateful for. And that's definitely been part of our history. And, um, you know, in terms of food there, we've always, of course, given away food. We've used food as a fundraiser, which I think all faiths do. Um, it's a great way to get together. And for us, it's celebrating our Japanese American heritage, probably for a lot of other faith traditions. There's you know, it's a blurry line where culture ends and faith begins. So, you know, when trying to keep our Japanese culture alive, a lot of times it is through the Buddhist church and, or Christian church, because a lot of Japanese Americans are Christian. So for us, it's interchangeable. We don't really care. And, and oftentimes we will have interface services with both a Buddhist and a Christian minister. And um, uh, yeah, we, you know, uh, gratitude is a key word in the Buddhist faith. And um it is hammered into our heads and we have to, we say it many, many times. We try to think it or act it, even if we don't feel it is a feeling of gratitude. And so um, that's shaped my approach to food as well. So um, yeah, that's, I don't know, that's best I can say, but I, I still have a lot to learn. <laughs> oh, don't we all. Uh, so I have another question. Um, how can the church help to build local food systems? Um, what, what can we grow or how can we grow it? What could we do with our spaces? And how would we educate our volunteers and train them? What are your thoughts on all that? Amazing question. I mean, communities of faith have the greatest assets in many parts of the country to change our food system. First, land, which is in high demand, particularly for urban farmers. So if churches have land that's not being used in a rural or urban setting, open it up and let some people come farm there. That could be amazing. You don't have land, you can, um, I know of some um, churches here in the Bay Area who do establish sort of a sister city relationship with a farm and they take congregants out there to work sometimes, to do pick for themselves, you pick operations or to gather um, excess food for food banks. So having that relationship with the land, I think is really fun and useful. Um, and then of course, the fact that you all have kitchens, kitchens or auditoriums is another, you know, huge asset that I hope would not, you know, go wasted any day of the week. You know, there's such hunger for access to commercial kitchen yeah. um, by food entrepreneurs and food activists. So if there's any, or if there are any um, 
food preparation spaces um, that are food safety compliant. I think it's wonderful to partner with organizations. There's a great group here in, the, in San Francisco called La Cocina that trains largely immigrant and women of color to sort of professionalize and market their food businesses like, you know, those tamale women and um, get them into food courts or get them into, you know, uh, brick and mortar operations. And for many of those folks, having access to a church kitchen can be a game changer in terms of their, you know, own livelihoods. So yeah, I think, um, you know, that's such a huge, such a huge asset. And also, I guess you can train young people to care about the food system, you know, if they're volunteering in your soup kitchens or other places, um, that can be a beginning of a lifelong um, interest in food and service. Yeah. So in the in our closing moments, is there something that um, that California is doing, your own home state is doing, um, that it, that may be a hair ahead of other parts of of the country um, or Colorado? What 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 can you say about that? Oh, fun question. I think we're, we've made advances, but we're also behind in so, so many ways. Um, well, I guess the recent thing that I think is interesting and exciting is this stimulus payments for undocumented families. I think that's pretty huge and it's been a logistical undertaking, but you know, I think that's a measure of humanity in these difficult times. Um, you know, where we've fallen down has been on, on making sure social services are really functional and efficient for everyone. So I do, you know, I like, to, I study the gap between dreams and realities with regards to policy. So I think we have good dreams in here in California, but I, I think we need to um, focus even more on the lived experience of people and, and how we can, you know, make life better for everyone. But, um, you know, getting back to gratitude, we're very lucky to have this, um, you know, beautiful landscape. Um, and we're trying to figure out the best way that we can preserve it by reversing climate change. So happy Earth Day, everyone. And I think we all, you know, have a role to play to um, uh, reverse climate change so that we can all, you know, keep living in this, uh, this outdoors life that I guess both Colorado and California are known for. But um, that'll only happen as long as we, you know, um, keep our earth clean <laughs> so yeah so that's 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 where I, that's where i think it is i guess yeah we we I, i'm interested in us staying in touch as a region you know because we share a lot the, the west the southwest the west coast you know and we're all we share a lot of natural environment and also of course history as being part of mexico so um, we should just all stay in touch more yeah yeah collaboration I Absolutely. guess state lines. Yeah, I, it's really been nice having you. Thank you for taking the time to be with us, sharing your wisdom and your experience um, and your travels. Where can we find you, and what organizations should we check out? That you're oh, part? thank you so much. Thank you. It was really gracious, and really appreciate the invitation. Um, uh, let's see. Please. Um, look at the website food.berkeley.edu where you can sign up for our mailing list. And we distribute two mailing lists, one of news and events and also one of food systems opportunities that includes, you can sign up at the bottom of that, of that page, Michelle just posted. And you can, if you know someone looking for a job in food systems, um, we send out the food systems opportunities list every week. Um, and my own website is ninafichikawa.com. And I'm also on Twitter, which is, um, you know, I, I, a fun way to share news and information. I don't get in arguments with folks there. I just try to like share news. Um, oh, it's Nina F. Ichikawa with an F as in Frank. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, keep in touch with me and, um, you know, um, love to stay in touch with you all. Well, thank you so much. Um, I don't have, I wonder if our, um, our producer is wants me to insert what our next next thing is. Not yet. She is shaking her head. Um, again, Nina, thanks so much for being with us. The third thank you for having me. I look forward to being in touch with more of you and keep up the great work. Oh, thank you. Take care. <laughs> The Thurman, stay, stick with it for just a second. The okay. Thurman Conversation Series is sponsored by the Race Task Force of the Episcopal Church in Colorado and St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Lakewood and produced by Michelle Auerbach. As always, if you like what you are hearing here, don't tell us, tell your friends. Stay safe, love your neighbor, wear a mask, get vaccinated, and wherever you go, go in peace. Have a blessed evening and good night.
Thanks, Neve. Take care.